Good evening ladies and gentlemen, this is Commissar here and I'm back for game number two of this best of three series featuring EG's Thorazane, sponsored by Raidcall, and Nanoa, the teamless Swedish Protoss. So it's a bit of Sweden vs Sweden action coming out from this DreamHack group stage. And we do indeed see Thorazane being up 1-0 at this stage, with Nanoa desperately needing to play out something on Entuned Value. Okay, so last game, of course, very disappointing by Nanowai, just solid standard play by Thorazane. Thorazane did nothing remarkable, took no particular early leads. He just basically had a build order counter to what Nanowa did. That's okay. That happens. Nanowai just has to put that behind him and move on, and hopefully, hopefully for all of our sakes as viewers as well, he can pull out something a bit more interesting to watch than he did in game number one. Okay, so Nanowai, of course, is going to be, um, what? We're on Entombed Valley, so what does that mean? It means probably going to see some sort of 3 base play, of course. Natural is very easy to secure, the 3rd base is close by as well. As a general rule, uh, this map tends to produce fairly, fairly long games. Uh, why do I say that? Well, A, it's incredibly, incredibly large. And while the warp gate mechanic can counter that with some builds, in this map, chirps not, not as often. Uh, that's more of a PvP. PVZ sometimes all in thing, but we do indeed see it close by third base, say these two bases very close together, very very easy to defend this third base in most scenarios. The fourth base, not too bad either. The fifth base is very very open, making it quite difficult to defend. Uh, at the same time though, it can be done if you have any sort of center map control. Long games tends to come into effect and the, uh, of course, the final bases in the corners are very, very far away from everything, which makes them very, very difficult to defend. But at the same time, of course, you don't want to send your whole army to attack them, because that just leaves you wide open down the middle. As such, you'd expect to see generally long games from this map. There are lots of bases, lots of space, and I'm just going to have to wait and see what indeed is produced by these two players. We do indeed see a Zealot coming out from Nanawa. A lot of players do skip that Zealot in this matchup, but we do just see one coming out at the moment. Uh, the Zealot, probably not going to achieve too much. We are seeing a Barracks before Command Center from Thorazane to get his fast expansion. As such, I'd expect him to be completely fine in terms of his um, defense of, like, say, a couple of Zealots, Zealots Stalkers at the very start before Warpgate. But it is important to note that we do see two gas geysers from Nanua with only two workers on each. As such, we're just going to see a very, very specific build coming out of Nanua as he is managing his gas very, very closely. What's also interesting to note is that he's getting warp gate, he's getting sentries and whatnot, and his mineral count is now being spent on that expansion. There we go. Just wondering when that was coming down. It's a slightly slow expand for this matchup. The expand of Thorazen going to be well, well ahead. It's going to be ahead by a little bit over a minute, in fact. And we are also going to see this sentry before a stalker. This is very interesting, as that means, obviously, that we need to see the energy saved up by Nanoa for his build. So he's probably going to be a little bit vulnerable in the early stages of this game, uh, typically. And that may mean there's a window for this natural to be denied. But we'll have to wait and see, really, what comes out of Nanoa. Okay, we do indeed see a one-gate robotics play, so it is going to be very interesting to see how he uses this. There are, of course, many ways to utilize it. Uh, most probably it's going to go straight for this Colossi, although last game he did show that he likes the Twilight Council route as well. On this map, really, anything can work. I mean, there's wide open spaces, so it's great for charge lots to engage in the middle of the map, but again, there are many chokes as well. In the middle of the map especially, great for Colossi. So anyway, it's really, it's really whatever the player chooses. That's why this map is so cool. There are lots of interesting places in it, lots of interesting things can happen, and it's just so open for whatever. Just, just a nice place for the players to play out the sound games on. And we are still having quite a lot of downtime in the early stages of this map. We do indeed see the Marines just having to deal with this one probe. It will go down. That was just a scout for a very, very early third base that appears. Uh, so Nanawa does have a proxy pylon though, which has been placed over by this fourth base. Obviously a great spot to warp in for two reasons. One, it does watch the fourth, but more importantly, I expect for this game, it is going to be, uh, it's going to provide some option to harass this third base with potential zealot warp-ins over here. 
And oh, this is very, very interesting. Thorazane, very aware of the potential for proxy pylons, is going to actually scout this. And this is such clever play from Thorazane, and I love it. The question is, is he going to see it? Oh my god. Look at Thorazane. Look at his vision. He does not see it. His... His brilliant idea of sending out this SCV, for it was a brilliant idea, ended up failing because he thinks now that there is no proxy pylon. In his mind, he's confirmed it's not there, but it is there. He just didn't see it. As such, this could be very, very cool for Nanua very quickly. Very shortly, rather. Okay, so we are going to see this third base down for Nanua before the third base of Thorazane yet again. Last game, Nanua went for that quick third and failed to defend it. Can he do anything different this game? Of course, there is the issue that this map is a little bit bigger than the previous map, although it's not that big of a difference. Like, I mean, the difference between Daybreak is still a fairly long walking distance. Entombed, I mean, sure, it's a big map, but the distance from base to base isn't huge uh, for those Marines to walk across, especially if they do have medevacs to fly across in. But the big difference is Colossus Tech. And the Colossus Tech, as I said, is the most likely route for Nanawa to take, and he has taken it. He's also going to get his plus one fairly early on as well. And Nanawa is going to have some Colossi up before any pushes come, it looks like, because the uh, Medivacs haven't started just yet. And the Colossi are starting before the Medivacs. There will be Marine Marauder, there will be Stim yet again, so it appears that Thorazane is going for just about the same timing as last game. Which is... Almost surprising in that um, it generally in best of three series you might say play at different builds each game to sort of throw your opponent off a little bit that sort of thing in case there is a third game to sort of m mess with them a little bit. But again, going for the same strategy could potentially work. It was very solid last game. It's not particularly high risk. I mean, if this push gets crushed, sure that's bad for Thorazine. But is it likely to be crushed? Not really. Uh, what does a Protoss player need to crush pushes? They need AoE. That one Colossus will provide it. If a second Colossus gets out, this push could be demolished by force fields and by that Colossus. But really, with the Medivax out, it's not likely to be completely annihilated without at least doing something. And with it doing something, Thorazen probably won't lose the game by pushing it at this time. It's a very small commitment. It allows him to take his third, just takes pressure off of him, puts it onto his opponent, makes it third easy to secure. And meanwhile, of course, Nanoa is fully aware of what is happening this game. He does indeed see the force moving out. The Zealot is going to delay the push even more. I love this from Nanoa. Moving out the Zealot away from his base to just delay that for a couple more seconds. Maybe allow for another warp unit of units, potentially. A cannon is going down for Nanoa, which is a bit weird in this matchup. But, you know, every little bit helps. But here we do indeed see the choke. There are, is so much sentry energy here. Three full energy sentries makes a total of 12 force fields available, and it appears that rather than barreling, barreling down the front, Throzin is going to go for that two-pronged attack route, probably going to poke at that third with this force on the ground whilst doing a drop into the back, but oh, the Observer sees the drop, and I assume that Nanawa saw that too, and he is indeed pulling a Colossus and an Immortal to deal with that, and yep, he should be okay, going to lose a few probes, meanwhile, of course, over here, the main army of Nanawa. Waiting at the third base, the push is not actually going to come by Thorazane, as Thorazane realizes that is not my opponent's full army, he is ready for my push at the third base, and as such, that was about as smooth as it gets for Nanawa in that initial defense. Of course, Thorazane took no losses himself that were significant. He lost, I believe, what, either two marines or a marauder, I'm not quite sure which one. But the losses in this game have been very, very tiny for both players. Workers killed there with three, so, I mean, that probably paid for the guys that died from that medevac. But overall, a very, very good start by Nanawa, I'd say. Just because Nanawa expanded first, you'd expect the Terran to maybe be slightly ahead at this stage, but he's not. It's still anyone's game, though, so we'll have to wait and see what does happen as this game unfolds. Okay, so we are going to see Vikings coming out now, two at a time, by Thorazane. You really want to get to that six to eight Viking... Six to eight guys in terms of Vikings, uh, in order to deal with those Colossi effectively, in order to be able to start getting them down in a couple of rounds, in a couple of volleys of fire. But, I mean, all we do indeed see the Thai Templar transition from Nanawa, a very well timed transition indeed, as basically by the time Vikings are still. Vikings will still be coming out onto the field, as there are only six, there are six out now. But Vikings will still be being produced as this first Templar do come out. And of course, if the player, the Terran player overcommits to Vikings, suddenly the Templar, beco Templar become way, way, way too strong. 
The big question is, of course, how the engagements should turn out, because generally in this sort of matchup, when Templar are involved, when Storm is involved, it all comes down to the engagements, because Storm is just such a game-changing spell. So of course we have to watch out for two things. One, how the Vikings are dealt with, in with by the sorry, how the Stalkers deal with the Colossi. How will Nano control this Colossi? And two, how will the High Templar are positioned if there are ghosts brought in? If they're able to snipe the High Templar or what? As we do indeed see the Ghost Academy now completing for Thorazane. In terms of upgrades, we do see, see Thorazane about to hit 2-2 in upgrades in about two minutes. Meanwhile, Nanawa is going to hit 2-1, that 2 being the armor in about the same time. So there will be an upgrade advantage for our Terran player. It's not going to be too huge, but what's interesting to note is that we are seeing air attack. Four throws and gonna make those Vikings more powerful. And we are seeing three at a time production now on the vo those, those Vikings. And with ten Vikings already out, I mean, ten Vikings is a good number, but do you really need thirteen? Do you really need more than that? I don't know. There are five Colossi though, so the, the Colossus production is high for Nanoa. It's not gonna be the end of the world to have these Vikings. But at the same time, Thorazane's going to have a pretty weak standing army on the ground, his medevac count is quite low. And with a low medevac count, Stim becomes a problem. With a low medevac count, Storm becomes more powerful. Although feedback, of course, is good against the medevac on its own. So really, the big question is, uh, is it going to be an overcommitment here? He's stopped now, so it looks like it might be okay. And Nanoa does see this uh, move out coming by Thorazane. He's going to try and defend this newly established fourth base, and he should be okay in terms of his positioning to deal with this. Meanwhile, we see nothing going on by Thorazane. No drops anywhere, no counters anywhere, no, sorry, no double-pronged aggression anywhere, rather, and the observers do tend to deny that sort of play, and that is why we do see the triple observer play by Nanawa, apparently. Okay, so we do indeed see pilots over at the fifth base of Thorazane, well, the fifth location, rather. And we are seeing the fourths being taken simultaneously. But the cool thing to note by Thorazane is that he's getting two additional command centers. Probably just going to be for mules, just mine at bases super, super fast in unsafe locations. But this is the big warp in here, and they are going to see the ghosts, and how are they going to react? They are not going to. So Nanawa may be aware of the ghosts, he should be aware of them at least. And he's going to, just going to move out and decide not to go. And uh, now he's going to go, and there is a big storm taking out a big chunk of the army before this engagement starts. And the Vikings, are, of course, are taking so much damage. That was a big miscontrol there by Thorazane, losing a lot more than he should have. Supply-wise, it does not matter, though, as Thorazane is still very, very close to max indeed. Meanwhile, the Zelts are causing uh, quite a bit of damage here, a couple of kills between them. And not too much economic damage shells overall. But there was the mining time. This one Zelt getting an extra couple of kills where he shouldn't have been allowed to. And this probe is still in the back of the base of Thorazane, comically enough. Meanwhile, this has allowed Nanawa to take an aggressive map position. He is very, very close to his opponent, and he has pylons to reinforce with. Meanwhile, of course, he is building up a significant bank in order to start reinforcing, should a battle hit right now. If we do see a big battle right now, only one player will be able to reinforce quickly, and that player is Nanawa. Thorazane, of course, does have a very strong starting army nonetheless, so he is certainly in a decent spot. Uh, despite this for Nanawa. Although, I do like the position for Nanawa at this stage. He of course only has four bases, no fifth base is on the way. Important to note, he is leaving back High Templar to deal with any sort of drop play. Uh, maybe one at each base, yes, one at each base in order to help feedback and storm the ultimate counter to drops. And meanwhile, this is a good idea by Nanawa to try and harass a second base while attack at one angle, harass another. But, of course, that harassment was shut down very, very, very easily. Very little damage being dealt over here. Total number of workers killed this game, 11. Not the biggest deal in the world, although, of course, Thorazane does have a slightly smaller economy than his opponent. That's not considering mules, of course. With the extra orbitals, mules are a big, big deal. Okay, so over... For uh, Nanawa, we do indeed see him just sort of probing around, trying to look for any opening, and he's going to go for it. He's going to go for this planetary. The storm's acting as a kind of force field, shutting out the units of Thoros, and he's trying to get EMPs off, but he is not connecting with the majority of them. The, of course, storm has been used up at this stage. The Vikings are going to town on these Colossi. The Colossi are all going down. The Vikings is demolishing them. Colossi not protected at all. The storms in the end, perhaps protecting a couple of those units rather than blocking them out because a bunch were able to seep through regardless, and that was a big win for Thorazane, as he was able to just basically kill the Colossi uncontested. 
and most of the army of Thorazane was kind of safely away from the storm, safely away from the, um, the action. Okay, so Minoli Duin did see a big whooping of Archons for Nanawa, a very, very clever way to reinforce, because of course the Protoss player needs his AoE, and Colossae did not produce that quickly. What does produce quickly? Well, of course, Archons do. They take about, what, 20 seconds total, I believe? A couple of seconds for warping, plus about, I think it's 15 seconds to merge? Um, 12 seconds, rather. Okay, but anyway, it's quick. The big issue, though, is EMP. How the EMPs connect, because there's still a ton of ghosts, a ton of ghost energy. These Vikings are being repaired. Overall, the army is very, very strong for, Th for Thorazane, although there is one issue, which is this, that his Viking count is still high, and the Colossus count for Nanoa is basically non-existent. So we have a max Nanoa, maxed on Archons, High Templar, Charge Lords, that sort of army composition. Very weak against Ghosts, yes, which does, is okay for Nanoa, but again, the Viking's not going to be very useful in this engagement, but the EMPs are good, hitting the Archons, hitting a couple of Stalkers and an Immortal, all very vulnerable to EMPs. Especially those Archons and that Immortal. And those had Templar, but here's going to be the big push in with the split army of Nanoa. He's trying to make something happen, but his Archons have not even connected yet. His Zelts are being picked off by the army, by the starter step of Thorazane. And the EMPs are hitting absolutely everything but the High Templar, forcing the retreat out of Nanoa. So Thorazane playing this out very, very well indeed at this stage. And Thorazane realizing that he doesn't have that much use for Vikings in this fight, is going to try and harass with them, I believe, as some sort of counter-pressure. Of course, though, Thorazane is covered on all fronts. He is basically looking pretty safe at home, despite uh, this army trying to probe in, trying to push forward. And really, sure the Immortals, the big Immortal switch, sure the Vikings aren't that great against them, and by the way, Colossi coming out, which the Vikings will probably crush, but the EMPs, the EMPs are the big issue here, and what I'd like to see from Nanua is perhaps the use of some warp prisms to try and save those units from EMPs to try and do some lift up action. Maybe more high templar, more warp prisms, and less trying to barrel down the throat of a big Terran army which can just demolish the shields of this Protoss army. So really I like Thorazane's position here. Nanua though, in a very good spot of his own, he does have a big bank, he has a bigger bank than Thorazane, he has five bases now, he's been one base up for quite some time. Again, though, the incomes will be pretty similar at the moment. The mineral income, in, of course, in the favor of Thorazane. Gas income in the favor of Nanawa, due to those extra arc orbitals that were added earlier. Still, orbitals continue to be a threat towards Thorazane's economy throughout this game. But that is only one form of harass. It's been kind of decent. We're going to see a couple more zealots getting in here as well. Oh! High Templar? Was that High Templar sniping? I'm not entirely sure it was sniped just there. Um, meanwhile, of course, just anything that can be sniped are being sniped by Thorazane. Very, very good pressure. And the fourth base is again under threat, but I feel like Thorazane's army is in such a good spot. I feel like the ghost count is too high. I feel like it's just going to crumble here. The planetary, though, is going to go down. The force fields are brilliant. The ghosts, though, are seeping through and are going to force... And are going to, yeah, be forced back actually by the storms. So that was a big win for Nanawa here. And Nanawa is suddenly starting to look quite commanding in his position in this game. As he is, again, not ahead in supply. But his bank is so, so, so big. It's ridiculous. He only has 14 gates. Uh, well, rather 12 gates. That's a little bit odd. I would expect him to add on like maybe even 10, 15 more at this stage. Just because he has the money to and he has the... He just has such a big bank, he wants to reinforce. He's not doing that, which I feel like is a big mistake. But his army's good, his uh, money's good, his base count is good, it's better than Thorazane's. And upgrades-wise, we have 3-3 three, three versus 3-3, three, three. and here we do see the Archon being sniped by Thorazane. A nice little pickup there, getting a few zealots and an Archon for free. And it is going to indeed just sort of intimidate Nanowise, he's going to just sort of back up a little bit. One goes overextending without actually getting off any EMPs. But the big thing that's confusing for me in this game is the High Templar, apart from drop defense, because uh, there were a couple just around the map for the sake of killing off drops, which appear to have gone away. They appear to have been used up elsewhere now. Um, the High Templar count has been quite low with the army. As I said, that he reinforces with High Templar. But, again, it's almost as if he's afraid of these ghosts, and Thorazane is just going ghost crazy, as if this was, what, pre-patch 1.5? or four or whatever whenever snipe was nerfed 
but that was against Zerg. That was a different story altogether. But it's been a long time since I've seen a ghost count of 22, which is what we see for Thorazane in this game. And again, Thorazane, despite Nanoa's uh, repeated harass, has been shutting down everything. There is one Zealot doing perhaps a little bit too much damage, but again, it, even it's not gonna actually kill anything. So units lost do show it being fa fairly uh, favored towards Thorazane, which of course he needs, being behind in these bases for so long. And the big issue I feel for Thorazane going forward is that he's been denied of bases quite a bit. He's gonna mine out in a couple of minutes, say five minutes, uh, within 10 minutes, he'll be mined out of these bases. He needs new bases or he needs to end the game right now. He has the army, his bank is starting to build up. Either he needs to actually be able to secure these locations and mule them up straight away by taking a strong position with his army, or he needs to just make something happen and end the game. But it's very, very hard to end the game when your opponent has a bank of 10,000 total resources, and that is what Nanoa is playing with. Okay, so Nanoa is of course just going to be waiting around, just again being very, very patient this game, perhaps too patient. His warp gate count is improved. Uh, it's back to a, up to about, what, 20? So that's not bad, not bad at all. Uh, of course, a warp in of 20 High Templar into 10 Archons is very, very powerful. The harassment continues over at the third base, but still, this entire game, well, a lot of workers have been killed over the entire game, and the worker count is kinda low for Thorazane. But really, with so many mules, he doesn't need workers for anything but gas, and his income is still fine, provided that he has bases to mine from, due to his orbital command count. As such, the harass I feel is not a big deal, all that matters to Thorazine is his army, and this harassment allows him to have more supply in army and less in economy. Whereas Manoa only has 130 supply in army versus the 170 supply in army of Thorazine. So you can see Thorazine of course having that big army supply lead, and that is going to favor him in this situation as both players have big banks at this stage of the game. Thoros Nano are trying to push the issue here, trying to make a big push, but the EMP said everything, although the High Templars are still with their energy up. The shields though of the army are down for the most part. A couple of free marauders there for Nano, not a big deal at all. I mean, of course, we are seeing the reinforcements coming out for Thorazane. Viking count still high, ghost count still very high. Ghost marauder Viking um, medevac, very, very powerful. I mean, well, of course, Moisev has been killed, but like I said, Thorazain doesn't even care enough to retreat them at this stage, due to his mule count. So what, these elves coming in, it doesn't even matter. They're being cleared out, they're not doing anything too, too big of a deal. And really, the only thing I'd like to see from Thorazain is perhaps more use of these gas geysers, which is a bit odd. I mean, well, of course, we can see the Vikings trying to harass these colossi, just trying to poke in. Both players being incredibly patient, but here's the big push by the Nanoa being EMP'd instantly, but the High Templars still have energy. Where are the storms? There is one storm coming down, but look at all these units. No shields on anything except for High Templar, and that is absurd. These immortals so, so squishy at the stage. I feel like this isn't the time for Nanoa to poke due to the EMPs, but he can't really change that. He's going to go for it anyway, and he is getting a lot of damage off with his Colossi. The Vikings, though, have cleaned them all up. And now is the time for Thorazane to push back in and do as much damage as he can possibly do. His Viking cap perhaps a little bit too high to deal with this ground force, but no. The army of Marauders, the Medivax being crucial, are going to, to uh, buy him a little bit more time. The big warp in from Nanoa is going to mean that he is going to be okay. He's not going to lose the game just yet, but the supplies slightly favoring Thorazane. That's going to change. Like I said, the, the bank was in the favor of um, Nanoa. But Nanawa is so far behind in units lost, it's quite ridiculous. It, it is still even though. Okay, so what, what I'd like to see out of Thorazine, sort of out of Nanawa rather, right now is perhaps a big push in right now, because he can remax a little bit faster. He can get units in instantly, and I feel like if he hits a 200 200 straight away, that'll be a decent window for him to do some damage. We know, of course, the space is being harassed by it. only a tiny group of marines, but enough to um, shut it down, really. Enough to require a response. I'm going to have to wait and see if Nanawa does indeed deal with that, or if he just moves on and tries to end the game right here. He appears to be doing that 200-200 supply push. He knows he can get out an army a lot faster than his opponent. He knows that 3-3-3 is kind of almost better, in a way, than 3-3. Fairly similar, though. 
and we are going to see again the armies meeting up for another big engagement. Of course, Thorazane's army is significantly depleted this game as Nanoa is going to move in. EMPs are what Thorazane needs to keep himself in this fight. The Vikings, of course, being fairly useless to supply against such a low count of Colossi. Only two of them are in the field at the moment. So, it's all going to come down to these ghosts. Can the ghosts be super, super cost efficient? Or will the High Templar get a couple of clutch storms and crush through the army of Thorazane? As a Thorazane loses this army, he loses the game. If Nanoa loses this army, he is completely okay. What's going for Thorazane is this one base is- Oh my god, even being denied by Nanoa. I couldn't see that on the minimap. But... Nanoa is looking very, very strong as a result of that little check. Nothing is actually going in the way of Thorazane right now. So he needs a big army to kill his opponent. That is his one hope. It's a decent hope too. As this army is about as good as it gets without maybe... Yeah, it, it's about as good as it could get. And of course the EMPs are of course keeping this army at bay. The Archons so so useless if they have been EMP'd. And oh, we are going to see Thorazen commit here to PC. He is charging forwards. He is trying to take out these Colossi at the very start of the engagement as well with his Vikings. And he is picking up so many Archons here. The army of Nanoa is melting in the initial stages of the battle. But now on lower health, Thorazen is just suffering the consequences of having little supply. The warping of Nanoa is huge. The Zelts are trying to make the battle last for Nanoa. As the more evenly can trade, the better. And oh, the storms are huge on top of all of the medevacs, but it is not enough as the healing is still too high. And Thorazane is again going to hold on for a little bit longer. But as I say, that 20 High Templar are being warped in simultaneously. The Bank of Nanawa is insane, but it is being depleted. And that is making this game very, very close indeed. Nanoa has been relying very, very heavily on his bank, but he's been fighting so inefficiently that the Terran player is in such a good... as he's traded so, so well that the base difference has been keeping Nanoa alive. It hasn't been keeping him ahead, it's been keeping him alive. And that is really ridiculous. This base over here, meanwhile, is going to be sniped by, Na by Thorazane with a couple of overstimmed perhaps marauders and the army of Nanoa look at it it's only high templar and archons with a few zealots and really this army is super 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 weak against ghosts and Nanoa struggling so much against these ghosts i really feel like he either needs to just go for colossi and just try to deal with the vikings try to control really really well against those vikings or go for war prisms the war prisms can use the can be sniped by vikings yes but they can potentially dodge GMPs. It, it, it requires good control from Nanoa, and we just haven't seen anything that remarkable from him yet this game in terms of his army control. He's played very solid in terms of his macro, but in terms of his unit control, it hasn't been super, super remarkable. We you know, of course, space is so, so vital for Thorazane to get a little bit more money to try and get to that point where he can remax. But again, Nanoa has been great at denying faces. He's just trying to starve his opponent. The only problem he's had is just those battles. The battles where he's traded so inefficiently. So we'll have to wait and see what does happen as I bring up the units tab just to give you a better idea of what the battles are going to entail. Again, that lower CB count means that the armies are very, very even between these two players. In fact, Thorazane has a superior army despite that supply count. So in a big battle, Thorazane should be okay. And it's all up to Nanoa's bank, Nanoa and his bank, and he is indeed setting, re-establishing this fifth base over here. Meanwhile, sixth base rather. Meanwhile, Nanoa, sorry, Thorazane has been unable to get a fifth. That is the big deal. And can Thorazane remax out? It appears that he won't be able to. Thorazane's income is down to basically zero, and that means he's going to have to go for it and see what he can do. This is the big army of Nanoa, but it's pretty out of position at the moment. No Colossi in it at all. The EMPs are doing tremendous, tremendous damage to this army. Meanwhile, of course, the Zelts are just powering through as best they can. The EMP is going up on absolutely every unit. These Archons could be focused so easily, but it looks like the Zelts are doing so, so much damage. Meanwhile, of course, as soon as they die, everything melts due to the weakness of Nanawa without his shields. Meanwhile, of course, the army of Nanawa is being reinforced, but the, the Thorazane has so many medevacs that the DPS is significantly reduced effectively uh, as a result. And Nanawa, Nanawa has just depleted his bank, and he is suddenly in a lot of trouble. 75 to 79 supply at the 40 minute mark. All he has left is gas, and he that means only Archons, only High Templar, and those units both get EMP'd to hell. This face is going to fall no matter what Nanawa does, and suddenly it is Nanawa who is behind in the bank. Suddenly it is Nanawa who is just behind overall, and Nanawa 
has said something in Swedish before leaving the game. So that was quite ridiculous. Thorazen playing the most patient game I have seen in a long, long time. What we've just witnessed is Nanawa just trying to make something happen and being unable to figure out how to engage the army composition of Thorazen. So despite, despite the economies being so, so, so stacked, like at least a base up for Thorazen, for the Nanawa all game long, the trading, the trading was just so, so brilliant for Thorazane, it just didn't matter in the end. And despite the fact that Thorazane had basically mined himself out in almost everywhere, he was able to pull through in the end with just the bare minimum surviving. I mean, you can imagine, you can imagine that if this, uh, if Nanawa had another warping left, if he had his bank still up right now, if he had 5,000 resources and was able to get in a bunch more zealots, able to get another army out, that's game over. But the fact that these guys have used so, so well has just been so brilliant for Nanawa. Although, I would like to bring up the point. 2,300 gas, that's what, 10, 15-ish? Yeah, 15, High Templar, I believe. 16, maybe even. The EMP energy was out. There was no more ghost energy left for Thorazane. And perhaps, perhaps, more Archons would have actually dealt with this. Something to think about. Uh, it's an interesting it's an interesting thought. But the big point is this base is going to die. That was going to leave an animal with a one base economy, which is basically mined out. So despite the, the, the player with more bases was actually mining out of the bases that Thorazane never secured. And just overall, well played by Thorazain. So I hope you enjoyed the series. Uh, please do subscribe. Please do tell me what to do better. I know I rusty with the casting. That's because I haven't been casting lately. So please give me some feedback. And I'll see you guys all on another day.